thanks very much for uh, staying all the way to just before lunch. We know we're between you and eating, so um, we really appreciate your uh, interest in this talk. Uh, we're going to be sharing uh, perspectives, which in and of itself is an important take home um, about campus orchid integration, that it really requires a partnership between multiple units um, because of the high level of engagement that we need to elicit from the, or the people, that, the authors that will ultimately be receiving and claiming their orchids and then doing something with those orchids. So this talk will present, um, will reflect the multiple perspectives of the Library Scholarly Communication Office, which is dedicated to um, authorship services. So our ORCID integration is situated in a larger program of trying to help our campus authors be wildly successful in the very dynamic and rapidly changing environment of the 21st century. So ORCID integration support is, um, is a sister program to things like copyright and fair use training, um, open access training and creative commons licensing, negotiating with publishers. Um, so the ORCID piece is establishing scholarly identity and then curating it through one's lifetime career. So we're educators. Um, and so that's our lens as we look at ORCID integration. And what's been really fun being here at this uh, ETT conference is that there's been other presentations, particularly Tom's from British Library, about sort of their use cases and their uh, lens for looking at ORCID. So my one regret is that we aren't all on the same panel together so that you could hear the back and forth between our perspectives. But I welcome that at any time in a Q&A or around a lunch table because I think these are honest questions and very important uh, debate to have is what work it, integration will mean to our various um, work in our institutions. Okay, with that said, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be referring specifically to the ORCID integration project as scoped for the grant we received. Texas A&M competed for and successfully proposed to integrate ORCIDs into the work of our earliest career scholars. So that at, at most primarily starts with grad students and electronic theses and dissertations, but you can't stop there. Um, we've also gotten a lot of interest and inquiry in the postdocs. In the vet school, we have residents and interns, so we're also at their early career. So our campus is very, very receptive to this idea of us helping them establish their scholarly identity at the beginning of their career. And that's the focus of this presentation. So there are additional issues like what are we doing with the faculty and the research staff, yada yada, that we're happy to talk about. But just um, to give you that caveat that this fo this, the focus of this is for an ETD audience and it's really about what we're doing around grad students and grad scholarship. Um, so we promised to ORCID and to Sloan Foundation as a condition of funding that we would be integrating ORCID identifiers with the works of our early career scholars, most specifically electronic theses and dissertations. We would be developing and delivering learning and outreach programs to encourage the actual uptake of those ORCIDs and the beginning of engagement with um, populating the profiles and putting the ORCIDs in other resources so that one could find the students, all of their works, not just their ETD, but other things they might have published or poster presentations, whatever. And then the final piece, and this is particularly important um, given the culture of assessment that I know you've already heard about from our thesis office and our graduate school, to assess student uptake and engagement to really test the premise whether it's a good idea to mint ORCIDs for all your graduate students. Um, we started with nothing. There was no knowledge. Things were unknowable. And so we kind of did this in the spirit of launch and learn, just so we could start having a data set and start generating evidence for what best practice with ORCID integration might look like. So forgive us that we don't, we may have more questions than answers. Um, the timeline for the 
project was in the fall, uh, October, we received notification, the happy news that we had been awarded an ORCID integration grant from Sloan and the ORCID Foundation. That mean we got cash. Um, we also got dedicated technical support from their tech side so that our developers really got a lot of hand-holding and you know, basically had ORCID on speed dial to try and navigate their, the, the documentation for the API and understand what was possible and then start testing it with different you know, attempts to query for different things, send data up, and all that sandbox work was um, really important, but we had to get ORCID's willingness to be there for us. So the grant program not only supplied cash to directly support stuff, but also their direct support, um, you know, giving us priority as a customer, I guess. Um, it was really important to secure administrative approval for policy reasons, particularly to make sure that we were keeping everybody safe and secure within the context of FERPA, which is our, our federal regulations to protect student records. And it was also really important early on to start the work of turning the ignition, um, alerting the campus to the program and alerting them to the change was coming, preparing them for change and essentially mobilizing the troops. Um, so we identified the key stakeholder groups for that alerting, um, which included the Graduate Student Council, the Council of the Graduate Deans, so those are the associate deans in every college that are responsible for grad programming in their college, the Council of Principal Investigators, which are largely the faculty advisors of most research on campus, um, the thesis office, Texas Digital Library, because they help us um, take care of and market and support Vireo, which is an open source ETD management submission and publishing system that we created at A&M, but has now been uptaken not only across Texas, through the Texas Digital Library, but we have a lot of Vireo implementations elsewhere in the country, far away from Texas, such as Harvard, MIT, Georgia Tech, Illinois, Johns Hopkins, et cetera. And so also um, reaching out to the Vireo users group to let them know that we were going to be mucking about with our instance of Vireo and then showing them what we did with respect to getting ORCIDs into that tool um, and then seeing if they wanted that brought up in everyone's instance of Vireo. So we were kind of speciating our instance sacrificially um, to see what we could do with ORCIDs in the ETD um, workflow process, and then went to the VUG, which is the larger community of Vireo users. And in May, at their annual meeting, they did indeed approve um, that, that Vireo should have, or all Vireo's instances should have the, the ORCID integration features. Okay. Um, in January, we, after all that bureaucratic and, you know, so, sort of taking care of the setting of the project, we began the actual work and we divided and conquer in three ways. Our, the IT team within the libraries began delving into the ORCID documentation and playing with the APIs and testing how you mint ORCIDs, how the the uh, recipient of the new ORCID is notified, what that looks like, were there any issues. Um, my, I led the learning and outreach team, which developed the communication plan, user support materials, including a live guide, and a lot of that stuff is on your bright green ORCID colored handout, all the different kinds of resources and tactics we devised to get the word out and to help people find ORCID help at any point in their um, ORCID workflow. And, um, and also make sure we could support existing ORCID holders, which turned out to be a major blob of the faculty. Um, and then we work with the marketing department to create ever important swag, um, because that has proved to be extremely important, um, especially for a campus that bleeds maroon. Um, we had to work very hard to transform the lime green and steel gray um, visual identity of ORCID to have some maroon in it because people thought all the stuff coming from ORCID were fishing attempts because they didn't see any maroon in any of it. Um, okay. And then finally, uh, before I turn it over to Laura, we minted ORCIDs in February for all 
10,334 graduate students of record, and we pulled that, those records from the campus directory. So that's our authoritative list of who's a graduate student at this time. Uh, we started the outreach and training program, and we began meeting with the first responders in the library, people that just work service desks, people that work the virtual chat service, people that staff the the frequently asked questions database, because we wanted to make sure that there was ORCID help no matter how the individual showed up or you know raised a hand. However they needed help, however they, you know, smoke signals, whatever, that we had an app for that. We had a way to help them. So I think I'm gonna turn it over. Oh I do. Okay, sorry. So then um, as we move into this assessment piece, which is where the grad school really um, became involved, is we wanted to start claiming uptake. And we weren't sure what the measures of uptake were, but claiming the ORCID in the first place was obviously like a, a, a landmark event that we could track and measure. Um, how they filled what they did with their new ORCID was something we could measure and track as some kind of a proxy indicator of engagement. Um, we to comply with the grant by May, the ORCID outreach meeting, we had to prove that we were capable of taking ETD metadata and a URL for where the ETD was and push it to the ORCID profile. We'd, we showed that in theory, but because we haven't had graduation yet, we couldn't use real data. So we, we demonstrated proof of concept that, that the technical part was done. And we started working um, with the the, the developers to have a middleware, ORCID, kind of an ORCID appliance on the web where people could go and ask everything they needed about, do I have an ORCID? What is it? Um, I have an ORCID. You don't know that. Let me give it to you so you can push it to all the other campus systems, yada, yada. And then this whole um, presentation here about assessment really started in, um, in the spring. Uh, and Laura's going to take it over. Howdy. Um, so I'm going to visit just a few minutes about the graduate school perspective being engaged with ORCID. So um, we were completely on board uh, when Gail uh, came in and um, offered, I think, this opportunity for us to um, engage in and support this project. And so um, there are a number of reasons why we felt this was important and beneficial for um, our grad school, for our students, and uh, for Texas A&M University. And first, um, it it was consistent, I think, with our public land grant mission um, and, um, and our service commitment. So a public land grant institution um, in the United States really is, I think, in one measure designed to kind of meet the practical needs of society and to prepare uh, students uh, to uh, meet those practical needs of society through teaching, research, and service. And so Again, it was kind of an extension of that, that underlying mission. And um, I think it's also consistent with other decisions that we've made around electronic theses and dissertations to adopt them uh, back in 2002, um, and also to be a first adopter um, and, and to lead a lot of efforts related to the Vireo ETD submission and management system, which, as Gail mentioned, is an open source system. Um, and. Um, and to disseminate our works um, in an open fashion. So another reason, I think, is that um, at, in the United States, there has been increasing national attention and public scrutiny of higher education. So um, federal and state governments are funding um, institutions at lower levels. Um, costs of higher education, particularly for students, is continuing to increase. Um, and as a result, uh, students are increasingly going into debt when they obtain um, a degree in higher education. And so there are concerns, I think, about job placement, about time to degree for graduate students and students in particular, uh, about retention. Um, and completion, and just a variety of different kinds of issues. And so um, because of that, then I think it's important 
for us to be able to demonstrate the value of higher education and graduate education. Um, and so we've been exploring, I think, various means for tracking outcomes and tracking career outcomes, particularly, um, and the impact of scholarship of our graduate students. Um, and so um, kind of looking at the landscape at the time when we were talking about this project, I think we recognized that there was limited data available for us to be able to use. Um, a lot of institutions um, participate in um, a national uh, survey program our graduate students do when they complete their program called the Survey of Earned Doctorates. And so there's some information there about graduate students and their, um, their graduate student experience and their plans for their career once they finish. Um, but again, that, that information is limited. And there are a few other ones similar to that. Um, but, but we saw this, I think, as an opportunity um, to have student level data um, and, and to be able to, again, have some mechanisms to track those outcomes for our students. And so um, I think one other thing is that because of, of cost limitations um, and kind of that increasing burden, um, we're, we are increasingly being asked um, in our administrative units to do more with less. And so you may, you know, have those experience at your own institutions. And so um, this project, being engaged in this project and, and, and having ORCIDs uh, was uh, seen as a benefit in the fact that we, we were able to integrate um, the ORCID or we would be able to uh, into the ETD submission workflow in Vireo. So with no really extra effort on the part of our graduate school administrators. And so there's a screenshot here that just shows you uh, that inside of our ETD submission management system, Vireo, um, we have configurable settings in Vireo which allows us to validate and authenticate the ORCID ID. And so we can turn on or off ORCIDs uh, for student views and then on the administrative side kind of manage uh, through these validation and authentication fields. But also on the student side, um, because the ORCID when it was minted was placed in the campus student directory, when the student logs in to Vireo, that ID is captured and it's brought into the system um, along with other student level information. And so again, the student really doesn't have to think about um, uh, putting this information in, and we also know that this information is going to be accurate um, and it's going to be populated uh, without students having to do something extra or having the potential to enter in something that would create an error. So uh, talking then one more time about benefits, I think we saw again that there were benefits for the university as well as for the student. Because it provided student level data, it had the potential to enable us to track outcomes, um, career outcomes as well as the outcomes, I think scholarly outcomes. and and. Um, and also to enhance the effectiveness of other efforts that were already going on simultaneously at Texas A&M University um, through the Vivo project, which I'll have a screenshot of that in just a little while. For the graduate student, again, I think there are other benefits. So as, as um, early career professionals, this is going to be uh, often one of the first scholarly works and efforts. And so they can, they can start managing their scholarly identity at the very beginning of their scholarly career. And I think, you know, in addition to, again, having the ability then to do that is, is the education that comes with that of, of training our graduate students to understand the importance of managing their scholarly identity. Thanks, Laura. So that's a great segue. Um, we usually seem to work seamlessly between the two units like that um, without even thinking about it. But um, I think this idea that the outreach and the, uh, the um, training was core was very evident when we got the reviews back for the grant proposal because one of the things ORCID was the most excited about was that we were going to develop 
training and outreach materials that could be reused by other campuses, particularly around grad students and, and postdocs, early career folks. And basically, Rebecca Bryant, the, the outreach uh, director at ORCID said, you're just gonna make my job a whole lot easier because you're gonna do stuff and then I can just leverage it. So um, we knew that this was going to be important, but once we got into the biz of minting orchids, that uh, point was absolutely um, verified and magnified. So the uptake and outreach part is really important for ORCID because, and this was discussed a little bit in Tom's talk earlier this morning, that the whole business model for ORCID is that the author who receives the ORCID ID is completely in the driver's seat for every aspect of that identity. And really the ORCID and the ORCID profile are kind of the author's dashboard that may never be public facing. If they want, they can put the settings such that it's only self facing. It's only an internal dashboard to the author to, to, to claim works, to ask for publishers to put in their latest article, to push their latest article in with the publisher's metadata being the most authoritative and, and correct and current. Um, and so uh, we really needed to train them on what to do with the 16 digit number once they got it. Um, and it wasn't so much the troubleshooting, like how do I you know, click through my email, although there was some of that. It was really the larger question of how does this fit into the professional development of a young, you know, an early career scholar. So one of the first things that had to be developed was, because we're working at large scale, you know, we've just mobilized 10,000 graduate students and their advisors and other stakeholders that are very engaged, all kind of like, what's going on with this? So we needed landing pages and kind of self-help on the web as soon as possible. And so your bright green sheet gives you links to a lot of those resources now. So we always put up a live guide anytime we want a landing page now. For you that work in the libraries, you're probably pretty familiar with live guides. For those that aren't, it's kind of a cake mix approach to the old like bibliographic instruction handout. Um, they're very standardized, they're very flexible. Um, they're basically set up with wonderful structures and templates already in place so you can just add your content, you know, add water and stir. Um, you can also copy pieces and parts of other live guides and import them into your new live guide on the, you know, a single click of a mouse. So that's really the, the most common way that now libraries are creating kind of landing pages. Just a place to start, a starting point for understanding a new topic or a new issue or a new program, whatever. So we have an ORCID live guide that you have a link to. Um, I also developed a cookbook, like a kind of a, for dummies, you know, what, how to do ORCID for the grad students. We made a PDF and put it in the repository so that we could collect usage data on the downloads of the, um, the handbook, the cookbook. We also made really nice color copies because we had grant money and passed that out to really key stakeholders to make sure that, you know, provosts and deans and the grad student council had very high quality print copies so that, you know, we started growing our fleet of champions and supporters for ORCID integration. We also gave them swag, like um, custom mugs with their own ORCID on them, things like that, ORCID t-shirts that clearly had the ORCID color scheme juxtaposed with the Aggie maroon, so everyone felt really good about us being involved. Um, we set up a dedicated email account, ORCID at library tamu edu. Um, so basically the idea was that we wanted high tech of, of help available conveniently and immediately 24-7. We also wanted high touch. And that combination of high tech, kind of married to high touch, to me is the, is the most important ingredient for success. Because you can mint, and that's the automated part, but as you're going to see in our uptake numbers, minting alone does not get people out of bed and engage. Um, and you'll see the, the raw numbers of just based on the minting and the fact that they got an email, you'll see that our uptake was between 20 and 25 percent. And we couldn't move that, that bar at all without 
really mindful, intentional, and ubiquitous high-touch support. So the next slide just gives you a few. I'll just rush through these because I know we're taking a lot of time. So uh, on the one side of the screen, you see the cookbook. On the right side, you see the live guide. Right now, there's like a silly little avatar that talks about Orchid. She's pretending she's a grad student. Marketing is going to actually start interviewing grad students and then put the videos on here so you can start hearing what Orchids are meaning to the grad students so you get more affidavits, more personal affidavits. Um, the, uh, this middleware that's going to keep us sustaining the ORCID program is going to have lots of functionality, but this is the first rollout, the first feature, which is that people can kind of look themselves up and say, what the heck is my ORCID, or do I have one? Um, so I just put myself in here, and then it came back, yes, you have an ORCID, and it, here it is. It gave me my ORCID hyperlinked. And if you click on that, you would go to my full, filled out ORCID profile so you could learn more about who I am and get my bio sketch and all that. Um, future plans for that middleware will be that if you have an ORCID that we didn't mint, you would be able to feed it into us, like putting cash in the ATM to add to your account. Um, so you'll be able to say, hey, I already have an ORCID. Can you add it in? Um, and so that's, you know, there are going to be lots of sort of maintenance and curation features that this middleware will help people with. So no matter what their issue is with ORCID, there should be an app for that in the middleware. There should be something, a remedy for whatever they're struggling with. Um, one of the most innovative and fun and actually successful ideas was for me to start having office hours in the thesis office so that we could catch people, whether serendipitously or just give them a more common, sensible place for them to wash up on the thesis office's shores with their ORCID questions. And we do this several times a week. It's on the thesis office schedule of training, and the students register on Facebook or online. And then we have one-on-one um, -on -one instruction. We've had groups. I've had faculty come in. And then if they come, we give them all that swag we created. So it works really well. Um, and then uh, with the, all that combination of the minting, which is the high tech, and now more face-to-face uh, -face support, we're starting to be able to measure engagement. And Laura is going to explain some of our methods for that. So just briefly, um, we, we took a look at the 10,000 plus orchids that were minted. And we found that 21% of those had been claimed within nine days of the minting. Um, we also wanted to take a sample of, um, of that 21% and just find out what the students were doing with that ORCID. Um, and so we were able to get a sample of 200. And we looked, again, we, we, we were able to hyperlink into the ORCID and, and just kind of see what aspects of, of their profile they had enriched or not. And so we found that 19% um, uh, of them had enriched their profile in some form or another. So if you then, if you look at the table, below that, you can kind of see what kinds of decisions students are making. So almost all of them were adding educational information. Um, half were adding some kind of employment information. Uh, less than that, you know, we're doing works. Um, and we found one that actually had chosen to deactivate their account. And so again, with that um, um, power to, uh, to claim and to manage their ID, some students are going to choose um, that, that, they, that they want to do something that maybe we were not originally intending, but, but that's the beauty of it. So. so this next slide is just showing you more anecdotal evidence of impact, which on a quantitative basis may not you know, it's, I don't know how useful it is, but I think it gives you a flavor for some of the really positive stuff that we're hearing. So, you know, um, we did our grad student association for the vet school, and they invited us, and uh, the room had capacity for 60, and 53 came. Um, we got a message from somebody who had been at the grad student council event. Um, that's the student, grad student leaders from each college. So we got thank yous, and I want to know more, and that's where we were giving out t-shirts for people that, you know, uh, really engaged. 
Um, and then we just got thank yous. These services are good tools to make us more visible. Thanks, and I really appreciate your hard work. Um, a professor who teaches technical writing, she's actually a nationally and internationally recognized expert in technical editing and scientific writing. She's been teaching orchids in her class, so we learned about that. Um, and then we had a, a, a workshop through the grad school recently and 47 people, which is pretty good enrollment. Usually these are in the afternoon. And that one I don't even think had pizza and soda. When we have pizza and soda, we have more, not surprisingly. Uh, the next slide is very anecdotal data, but it's just so wonderful I wanted to share it. This is the blog of an English doctoral dissertation writer. She uh, hasn't submitted yet. She's a PhD candidate in English. And this is her blog. And she goes on to say who she is. And note at the bottom is her orchid with hyperlinked. So you can go see what she's been putting in her profile. And then the next slide shows you her profile. And so she's somebody who's flushed out her profile pretty well. She's put in under her name and the orchid. You can maybe see she's got a link to her website and her online CV. She's put in a little me, you know, one line who she is. She's put in all her education, her employment, and she doesn't have any other works yet, but her first work in this case will be that ETD. So that's what we'll be pushing in after graduation is certified, because we're the publisher of record for the ETD, and just like all the societies and the commercial publishers are all integrating ORCIDs so that when it, one of their authors gets published, it will then be the publisher's responsibility to present that author with the opportunity, do you want us to push in your article into your ORCID profile so that it's a more authoritative uh, citation with the link, the DOI, and also it reduces workload. You know, it's automatic. The author doesn't have to type in their work. It's already going to show up on publication. Now, always um, the ability of a publisher or any third party to either read the ORCID profile or push information to it, write to it, is only possible if that publisher or that entity presents us a trusted certificate to the author and the author clicks on and says, yes, I want you to do this. And just so you know, because we're learning this as the publisher of the ETDs, that gives us one hour, a very time limited window to push data. So if we want to keep pushing data over time, we have to keep communicating with the author. So that's the cost of ORCID, is you have to be continually engaged with the author. Unlike, I think somebody was mentioning with ISNI, you can do all this without them knowing. So it's a preference. Do you feel that having author have agency over their profile is an important value? We do, and that's why we like working with ORCID. Um, here's one more example of engagement, and I just think it's so adorable, I had to show you. This is a Chinese author, and you can see that features largely in his story under his biography. But look at the also known as put in his Chinese, his name in Chinese, which I think is wonderful, and speaks very largely to how important ORCID is becoming to our international grad students who are probably suffering the most with name identity issues because there are some countries where um, I think they say 120 surnames in China represent the majority of last names, and in Korea one third of the population has the exact same name. Well, that's a big chunk of our grad population, our Asian and uh, Central Asian and Mideast and um, Far East um, international students. So I just thought it was lovely that he's got his Chinese name under his AKA. Um, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Laura to wrap up with lessons learned. I have just a few minutes. So I did want to just point again to the importance of the partnership between graduate professional studies and the libraries. I think we found over time with this project as well as other ones that it takes both of us working together to, to make what we're doing and, and um, successful and to be able to reach the, the outcomes that we want to achieve. And so uh, just, I think, to understand the 
you know, our, we felt that our role in a lot of ways was really trying to facilitate connections uh, between the grad administrators, the students, and the libraries, as well as to try to help overcome some of those perceived roadblocks related to student privacy rights and things like that. Whereas the libraries really, again, were those experts about the importance of ORCID and how we were going to actually um, um, uh, educate these students and create the systems and mechanisms to, to do what we wanted to do. Um, that being said, I think there's still a lot of work left to do. You could see based on that screen on engagement that we still have a lot of students that, um, that we need to engage in this process. There are also some things that we need to do in terms of the Vireo ETD system and pushing um, those enhancements out to our other Vireo users as well as um, maybe doing some extra work in terms of being able to contr uh, control uh, uh, language in terms of uh, gathering faculty committee member names and to be able to integrate with our Vivo project, doing additional work in terms of student assessment. There's just a great deal, I think, uh, left for us and opportunities left for us in the future. I wanted to show just this screenshot of the work that we've been doing, and I haven't, but the libraries has been doing with Vivo, which again can help us to be able to uh, create relationships and, and connections between uh, the graduate student advisors and their advisees, and also then being able to link through and look at the publications of those advisees. And again, so that's kind of us looking forward into how we're going to be tracking those outcomes. So that being said, thank you for your time. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator. <laughs>